Welcome to tonight's event, Philip Roth and the Modern Jewish Predicament. I am Terry Gordon Zoloff, Director of the Jewish Cultural Studies Program at the New School for Public Engagement. This event is meant both to honor Philip Roth, who turns 80 tomorrow, and to reflect on his vision of the modern Jewish predicament. Um, this event has been made possible by the generous support of the Posen Foundation. Jewish Cultural Studies has partnered with the Posen Foundation on numerous events over the past four years, and I am delighted to see such a wonderful turnout for this event, and I applaud your heroic efforts to make it despite the snow and hail. I would like to thank everybody who has uh, helped put the program together, and in particular, Jesse Tisch, director of the Posen Foundation, and Pamela Tillis, director of public programs at the New School for Public Engagement. Now it is my pleasure to welcome our panelists, Professor of Jewish Civilization Jacques Berlinerblau, who's in the middle, communication scholar Leo Leibowitz, and literary critic Adam Kirsch. Professor Berlinerblau will, will moderate the panel. He is Associate Professor and Director of the Program for Jewish Civilization at Georgetown University. He has published extensively on a variety of issues ranging from the composition of the Hebrew Bible to Jewish-American relations. His most recent book is entitled, How to be Secular, A Call to Arms for Religious Freedom. So I will turn the floor to him, and please uh, do join us for a reception after the event. Thank you. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming up tonight. You could have done all these things in New York City, but you decided to share it with us, so thank you so much. My name is Jacques Berlinerblau, and first off, I want to thank the Posen Foundation and its director, uh, the very energetic Jesse Tisch, who's hiding in yellow over there. I also want to thank our friends at the Jewish Cultural Studies Program at the New School for Public Engagement, and of course, Professor Zoloff. And again, I want to thank you. It's such a uh, relief and a motivation and an inspiration to see a room full of people to discuss literature in the year 2013. I think we're doing something right. Ladies and gentlemen, 79 years and 364 days ago, to, yeah, today, Philip Roth was born in Newark, New Jersey. A smattering of applause. Right? Um, to celebrate and critically discuss the work of one of America's most important writers, we have gathered here today at my alma mater, the New School. It was called the New School for Social Research back then, and the bathrooms were co-ed, I'd like to point out, when I was here. That is actually true. Uh, we do so in the company of two preternaturally smart Jewish boys. Um, the first one, who is going to be playing the role of the villain tonight, or, or the Irving Howe, character, for those of you who know who Mr. Howe was, is Liel Leibovitz. He is senior writer for Tablet Magazine and visiting assistant professor at the Department of Media, Culture, and Communication at New York University. He's the author of several books, including The Fortunate Sons, The 120 Ch Chinese Boys Who Came to America, Went to School, and Revolutionized an Ancient Civilization, The Chosen Peoples, America, Israel, and the Ordeals of Divine Election, Lili Marlene, The Soldier Song of World War II, that's a lot of writing, and Aliyah, Three Generations of American Jewish Immigration to Israel. Professor Leibovitz's most recent book is A Broken Hallelujah, the Life of Leonard Cohn, which is due for publication this spring. His writings have also been published in the Los Angeles Times, the Atlantic Monthly, and Descent. And I mentioned Tablet, which is the It magazine uh, of our decade, and I hope it remains so for a good long time. To my right is another preternaturally smart uh, Jewish young man. This is Adam Kirsch. He is senior editor at the New Republic and a columnist also for Tablet magazine. His essays and reviews also appear in The New Yorker, The New York Review of Books, and other publications. He's the author of two books of poetry, The Thousand Wells and Invasions, and four other books, including most recently, A Critical Study, Why Trilling Matters. Uh, if we could give them a nice round of applause. Ready to go, fellas? Yeah? All right, we're going in. All uh, right, well, I want to begin by asking each one of you to discuss a Roth novel that you are particularly fond of. And I want you to isolate why it is that it elicits that euphoria, that bliss, that joy. Adam Kirsch, you first. Well, 
there's a lot to choose from, obviously, and, and all very different. That's one of the things about living so long and writing so much. I think the one that I would single out is The Counter Life. And in The Counter Life, he says, uh, if you write 30 books and you win the Nobel Prize, which of course he hasn't, although maybe you should, um, and you're from New Jersey, the best thing you could hope for is to have a rest stop named after you on the New Jersey Turnpike, and that someday some little boy in the back of the car will say, stop at Zuckerman, I have to pee. <laughs> um, maybe one day that'll happen. Uh, the counter life, I think, because it does something that I think is very rare for metafiction of that kind. For those of you who have read it will know that The Counter Life is a very experimental novel full of metafictional techniques in which the same story is told over and over again from different points of view with events happening to different characters so that first it's uh, Zuckerman's brother who dies on the operating table in an operation designed to restore his potency. Then it's Zuckerman himself who dies on the operating table. In one strand, the brother goes to Israel and becomes a settler in uh, the West Bank and a religious fanatic. Uh, in another one, Zuckerman moves to London and marries a non-Jewish woman and deals with English anti-Semitism. And all of it is very self-conscious about the artifice of writing, the artifice of, of creating these characters in a fictional way. Ordinarily, that sort of thing doesn't move me. It leaves me cold. The reason why I think it does in The Counter Life is that it gives you a very vivid sense of the writer as a sort of damned soul. And I think that's something that you have to respond to. Maybe we'll get into this. Um, if you're going to like Roth, if you're going to admire Roth, that it gives you the sense of the writer as living in a glass bubble almost and projecting his worlds on the sides of the bubble, but without any way to break through into the actual outer world. And it's very self-conscious about that. Uh, so that reading that, you would get the sense from Roth that writing is a sort of glorious but also cursed destiny. And recently, uh, Roth was in the news, among other things, for telling a young writer that he should stop writing. This was a story that was published, I forget where, where someone who was a, a waiter at Barney Greengrass, who was a novelist, approached Roth and said, I just published my first book. The book was called Balls. He handed Roth a copy of Balls, and Roth said, I'm surprised I haven't used that title myself. And then he went on to say, you know, you should quit while you're ahead because writing is a terrible career. You shouldn't do it. And there was much pushback against that and people saying, you know, it's easy for him to say um, he shouldn't discourage a young writer like that. But if you read The Counter Life or I would say any number of other Roth novels, you get the sense that, such as The Ghost Writer, for example, that being a writer for him is a very ambiguous fate and his ability to sort of communicate what that means, that the suffering involved in it, I think is moving in that novel. Well, readable metafiction, as opposed to a lot of unreadable metafiction, which exactly. we won't discuss here, but there's a, experimental novels in general tend to sometimes uh, not tickle our fancy that way, and you just want to read The Counter Life. Uh, now, Liel, uh, we know that you have some, shall we say, concerns about uh, Master Roth, but before we get to those, tell us about uh, a novel or a work by Roth that you really do appreciate, and tell us why. Sure. Um, <clears throat> there's there's a, an old Jewish saying that I think is sort of the embodiment of compassion that says that even a blind squirrel occasionally stumbles upon a nut. Um, to, to me, that nut is Operation Shylock. Uh, and, and Roth didn't so much stumble upon it as sort of, sort of ran into it headfirst gleefully. Um, I, I just reread the book for, for, for our encounter here and, and was... Uh, was sort of delighted to learn that it has everything uh, in abundance, uh, everything that makes uh, uh, Philip Roth, uh, you know, in my opinion, uh, such a terrible writer. Uh, and, and, and everything is there, not on display, uh, but on parade. It has those sort of uh, insufferable uh, self-indulgence. It has those uh, uh, weighty uh, metaphysical constructs that upon uh, more careful examinations uh, turn out to be essentially just intellectual parlor tricks. It has uh, the postmodern sleight of hands and plot twists upon plot twists upon plot twists, uh, but it has so much of them uh, and, and so gleefully presented to the reader that one just walks away unable to do anything but actually appreciate the, the, the sort of vivacity. And, and, and this is a theory that, that, that I don't know. I noticed, I, I was about to say, the other no novel I was about to say was Sabbath's Theater, which, which has all the same things. And, and, and this is a theory I, I'd like to advance here, uh, which is there is an odd parallel to me between, between the career tracks of, of Philip Roth and Britney Spears. 
Um, <laughs> you know, they both begin uh, as sort of young, uh, precocious performers uh, who are extremely over-sexualized and therefore appeal to a very certain demographic. And they both end, as we see Brittany now, as sort of these sort of, you know, middle-aged fuddy-duddies who just sit and, and opine upon their former glory. But there's a moment right there in the middle when they go crazy. You know, when Brittany shaves her head and abandons all undergarments forever, and, and when Roth says, you know what, I'm not going to write The Counter Life, I'm going to write Operation fucking Shylock. I'm going to go crazy. It's going to be about a man named Philip Roth who goes to Jerusalem to see another man named Philip Roth who may or may not be involved with the Mossad. And all this takes place as there's a trial of a man who may or may not be Ivan the Terrible, who's a Nazi, you know, death camp guard. It's just so much that it works so beautifully. So the shamelessness inspires a certain awe. A That's what you're a more saying. is more aesthetic. It, it's, it's actually delightful. It held up for me. I was surprised. All right. Well, I think we understand where Liel is coming from. Of course, I will push back, but it's, we're, we're here not to just praise the man, but we are here to uh, assess the, the ups and the downs, and this is all quite good. So Liel, now that we've got you going, why don't you point to some less successful attempts? You recently wrote a very funny takedown uh, of Philip Roth, where you made mention of, uh, and I quote, the superabundance of cock that appears in his fiction. So other than the superabundance of cock in his fiction, what rankles or disappoints about Roth's oeuvre? Um, <clears throat> the short answer would be almost everything, but uh, I, I, I prepared uh, for this very, very thoroughly. Uh, one has an obligation when one is you know, performing the duties that I perform here tonight. And I came across this amazing essay from 1975, I believe, in commentary by Irving Howe, which, which Jacques alluded to before. Uh, and, and honestly, I wish I could just stand here and read you the whole thing. It's uh, 7,500 words long. Uh, it, will take, it will take a while. It contains the most, uh, one of the most beautiful sentences I think Howe has ever written, which is uh, the most cruel thing one can do with Portnoy's complaint is read it again. Um, but, but, but I won't, uh, and, 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 and I want to keep this discussion serious because it's really easy to, to sort of be glib. Uh, I, I want to share with you one thing that, that uh, Howe had written that I think is absolutely right. Uh, Roth, uh, Irving Howe wrote, Roth is not a writer absorbed in human experience as it is, mirroring his time with self-effacing objectivity. Nor is Roth the kind of writer who takes pleasure in discovering the world's body yielding himself to the richness of its surfaces and the mysteries of its ultimate course. If one recalls some of the mot motives that have moved our novelists, a hunger to absorb and render varieties of social experience, a respect for the plentitude of the mind, a sense of awe induced by contemplation of the curve of heroic fate, a passion for moral scrutiny, None of these seems crucially to operate in Roth's work. It is, in fact, a little comic to invoke such high motifs in discussing that work, and not because, and this is the most beautiful sentence in the entire essay, and not because Roth is a minor writer, but because he is a writer who has denied himself, programmatically, the vision of major possibilities. Uh, what rankles me is, is to be in the presence of what I believe everyone in this room, and no one would be in this room if you did not agree with the statement that Philip Roth is a writer of considerable talent. Uh, what rankles me is to see him again and again and again retreat into this, programmatically might I add, uh, in, into this construct, which, which works more or less the same way every time. It begins by setting up... Um, a fairly solipsistic quest uh, that is that is that is sort of configured around the self, but not the self as as a, as a launching pad for further exploration of outside world, but rather the self as as spiral. Uh, and then, when you try to ask it uh, about the outside world, when you try to point out uh, facts of of inconsistencies within its own logic, uh, for example, to tell it that not the entirety of the 1960s. Uh, radicals, for example, were, were quite as, as miserable and monomaniacal as uh, Mary Lvov in, in, um, in American Pastoral, uh, that not America in its entirety was involved in this moralistic fervor that the Republican Party displayed, as he you know, claims in, in uh, The Human Stain. Uh, he comes at you and says, hey man, this is just satire. Why are you such a square? Why can't you take the joke? Well, well satire has its obligations. Uh, satire has its, its, its responsibilities. And, and the responsibilities of satire, and I would argue the responsibilities 
uh, if I dare be so, so presumptuous, of, of, of art uh, in its entirety, uh, is first and foremost to explore, uh, and this may sound you know, somewhat uh, over simplistic, but to explore the human condition. Uh, I have never seen Roth do that. Hmm. Well, all right, I want to go I want to go to Adam. Let's talk about Irving Howe for a second. This is an improvised question. Now, the piece that uh, Liel alludes to uh, elicited what can only be called a literary revenge killing in the form of Philip Roth's 1984, The Anatomy Lesson. Now, what did Howe accuse Roth of? He accused him of basically being a vulgarian, right? As we read Roth and we come to grips with what I might call his transvaluation, where he argues, well, yes, we are all vulgarians. To be alive is to be vulgar. One sees, I think, a very serious defense in the anatomy lesson and in later works right, of vulgarity as a proper literary virtue, of vulgarity as something that writers must explore with heavy doses of shamelessness. Adam, could you comment on that? It, well, it, there's this new documentary about him that's playing at Film Forum, and it's going to be on PBS, I think, next week. And in it, the word shamelessness reminded me. In it, he says, um, I'm shameless. I'm not shameless, he says, in real life. I have plenty of shame in real life, but when I sit down at the desk, I become shameless. Um, I think it's true that there's something limited about his idea of shamelessness, that shamelessness is not enough, right? I mean, shamelessness might be a necessary condition for a writer, but it's not sufficient. So I think if you look at something like Sabbath's Theater, which is very much an apologia as I read it, um, it's saying these are all the things that people don't like about me, Philip Roth, except they're times 100, and none of the redeeming qualities. Mm -hmm. So it's about an artist, but it's about a failed artist who hasn't produced any art. And he, Mickey Sabbath, and he's relentlessly offensive and Roth takes this glee, and, and I think, to me at least, communicates to the reader the glee that he takes in contriving these horrible situations where everything Sabbath does is just more vile and repulsive than the last thing he does, and, and getting the comedy out of that. Um, I, I think, for the sake of argument, I don't totally disagree with what Liel is saying, but it reminds me of something Bellow said. Maybe we'll end up talking about Roth and Bellow. Um, someone asked Bellow about the writer's task, and Bellow said, tasks are for people who work in offices. Um, I think that there's something to be said uh, for that point of view when it comes to Roth also, that you can't criticize him for not doing X, Y, and Z, as Howe does in that quote. Um, you have to consider what it is that he does want to do, right? What it is that he does do. Um, I think that the world, the outside world, whose absence Howe talks about, drips away, or, or maybe it's intentionally evacuated. If you read something like Goodbye Columbus, it's actually interesting how attuned Roth is in that very early work to things like class, markers of class, um, the way people live in Newark versus the way they live in Short Hills, and that kind of thing, I think he deliberately turns his back on. He deliberately renounces it because he's becoming more interested in expressing this inner energy. And the books do become, and the counter life definitely fits this description, a series of tirades. I mean, that's really the great Roth form, is a tirade. It's someone uh, from Portnoy to Mickey Sabbath just letting it go and just explaining themselves, arguing, um, lecturing, hectoring. That's what he does. He doesn't do a lot of other things that fiction is able to do. However, I think you could make an argument that in his generation, the best writers didn't write like Tolstoy, for example. Um, the best writers wrote in a very limited way compared to what the novel can do. Maybe for some reason, now the novel can't do all those things. The novel can only do certain things. Um, if you look at, say, Jonathan Franzen, you could say Jonathan Franzen is someone who's setting out very consciously to recapture for the novel the scope, the realism, the social insight, and maybe the product is not very interesting. Um, that It's more interesting to focus, to be narrow, the way, say, David Foster Wallace was narrow in a, in a lot of ways, in ways that can remind you of Roth, maybe. To defend Philip Roth, all right, there's the 1961 Letting Go, uh, a 540-page failed Jamesian mm. experiment by Roth's own admission, but nevertheless a very serious novel with not a lot of cock in it, Leo, not a lot, all right? There's also the 1967 When She Was Good, allegedly his uh, tip of the hat to Gustave Flaubert, Again, uh, not a uh, salacious text by any stretch of the imagination. Plot against America, every man, indignation, nemesis, a very serious meditation on polio. Talk about unsexy and unvulgar. 
So just do, this is what we call in Washington pushback. Or is it a little pushback here, Liel? Maybe Philip Roth is a writer that can write in a variety of gears and a variety of styles and to pigeonhole him or to reduce him to the bathroom jokes, which he indulges, right? To the raucous humor, to the shameful self-exhibition is perhaps to constrict uh, a writer whose oeuvre is rather capacious and broad and diverse. Yes or no, Leo? Absolutely, which is why the tragedy of him having chosen to do exactly that for the past four decades, uh, you know, really, really disappoints. Uh, I, I, I read some time ago, uh, Letting Go, and, and thought it uh, a, a failure, but a very charming failure. A uh, it's, failure. it's a failure in all the right ways, because it's a failure with all the right aspirations. And, and Adam, I disagree with you uh, that scope necessarily dictates uh, the essence of one's aspirations. I, I can think of tirades, and I'm thinking, for example, of uh, Louis Ferdinand Saline here, uh, who con that contained multitudes. Uh, I could think of, of, of vulgarians uh, who have at heart uh, goals, uh, uh, constructs, far larger than, than the, the continuous um, adoration uh, of, of some narrator figure very close to themselves. Uh, and Celine is actually, I think, a very, very instructive figure to talk about here because he has that howling mad energy. Uh, he has that, uh, that uh, tyrannical tirade uh, mode, uh, and yet it is clear to you that, that what, he, what he is doing is he's howling uh, against something much larger than himself. And, and, and the way that you see that, and I, I, I don't want to spoil the fun, I'm assuming we'll get to this later, uh, is, is by virtue of actually proposing values that uh, contradict the ones that he's so mercilessly lambasting. And you read something like Goodbye Columbus, and you're thinking about uh, Neil and Brenda, right? Are these their names? And, and, and you say to yourself, you know, Neil really doesn't hate or, or bore or despise anything about the world of short hills, uh, except for, you know, barely distinguishable, you know, socioeconomic motives. It's not like Roth is saying, look, you are the, I'm using vulgarity to show you, as I think the best of satire does, to show you that you are truly the vulgarians, that the society that you have set up, that the values that you now espouse are, are ridiculous and rotten and, and corrupt. Uh, he does so simply to say, hey, look, you're idiots. And there's one smart guy in this room, and his name happens to be Philip Roth or Mickey Kapesh or Mickey Sabbath or Kapesh or any of these alternatives. Uh, that, and I say this now not, not with glee but with real sadness because I think, and, and, and God willing, we shall talk about Bello. Uh, you know, Bello is, is the exemplar of what happens when you say, you know, I'm, I'm going to retreat into myself. I'll, I'll make this very quick, but there's this beautiful story of, you know, Bello's in Paris and he's written The Victim. And what's the, what's the other one? The first one? Dangling Man. Yeah, right. Uh, and and um, he is working on the third novel. He got a Guggenheim or something, and he's terrifically unhappy. He hates every word of it, and he's feeling oppressed, and he's thinking maybe this whole writing thing was a mistake. And, and, and he walks in the street, and according to you know, his letters, he sees uh, a fire hydrant uh, having burst open, and the, fire, the, the, the water just bursts out, and the rays of sunshine hit it in a certain way. And he recalls this one incident from his Chicago boyhood, and, and he runs home and he starts writing. Uh, and he writes in order to capture the entire world. Uh, that's Augie March. Uh, this, this, is, this, is, this is what this could have been. This is where Roth could have gone after letting go. Not to say that he should have been Bellow, but to say that he should have aimed much higher. All right, I just want to reiterate, right? Whereas Howe accuses him of being a vulgarian and uh, obsessing over uh, vulgarity, Roth's retort, as I understand it in the anatomy lesson, is because that is life and that is what we must look at. So he sees it as his task or his role as a writer uh, to examine that. Here's a little Leo Leibovitz from his infamous uh, The Grapes of Wrath, and I'm going to ask Adam just to comment on it, uh, reminding me very much of uh, Norman Podhoretz and another critic, Joseph Epstein. I imagine it is more satisfying to crown the penis king and abandon morality, civility, responsibility, and all the other blocks which we build, step by painstaking step, the bastions of a worthwhile society. So my question for Adam is, can we look at literature as a uh, handmaid 
to the uh, glorious project of building a worthwhile society. Is Leo's understanding of what literature ought do consonant with your understanding of what literature or poetry ought do? Well, I mean, I think the, the key text to look at here for these issues is the ghostwriter, because in the ghostwriter, you remember he's, Zuckerman is visiting E.I. Lonoff, right? And Lonoff is, is like a writer who you would approve of because he's um, extremely abstemious. He's extremely dedicated to his art. He never leaves the house. Um, he's he's uh, sublimated everything into his writing. Um, in fact, he sounds very much like Philip Roth over the last 20 years, for at least the sense one gets, is that that's the way he lives now as well, um, even in the same part of the world, the Berkshires. And then you have Zuckerman in the study downstairs masturbating, right? And he, ma and he says, some, like, reader, if you think that after intercourse the human animal is sad, you should see what you feel like after masturbating on E.I. Lanoff's study or daybed or something like that. Um, that's the, the sort of primal scene where he says, um, I, I myself believed, I, Roth, I, Zuckerman, believe in these high Jamesian ideals. And I set out to capture them, and I was undone by sex, by sexuality, that I couldn't reach that way of living. I couldn't live that way because there's this inner demon, there's this inner contrariness, uh, this perversity, which is sex. And the other one is Jewishness. Those are the two things that drive him crazy. And so he writes about them both in a crazy way because for him, those are the things that you can't, that drive you crazy, right? You can't think about them in a sane, moderate, wise, and constructive way. And that way is unattainable. It's chimerical. It doesn't actually exist, though he strives for it and he fails. Right. Or I would say it doesn't exist for him. I, I would agree that Bellow is a greater writer, and the reason why is that Bellow has a sense of the metaphysical, and Roth doesn't have a sense of the metaphysical. In fact, he rejects the metaphysical explicitly. Um, in that book of Bellow's letters, there's a letter to Roth in which he says something along the lines of, uh, the difference between us is that you've always believed in the Freudian trinity of sex, money, and power, and I never have. And I think that's true. I think that that captures the difference, and that explains why Bellow is a greater writer than Roth. But I think that every writer has to be the writer who he or she is. And Roth has sort of been the patron saint of that, of sort of being true to yourself, amplifying oneself uh, so that it becomes unmistakable. Leo, care to respond to Adam? Yeah, I, I agree with that, but but I think that the, that the well the problem you're exactly right. The, the problem is metaphysical, right? The problem uh, about or the problem with Portnoy's complaint isn't so much it's it's extremely sophomoric uh, approaches to 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 both Judaism and um, and to and to and to sex, which by the way are are are, are and and this is this is a point that that could not be made enough. Uh, even accepting Roth's own premise, uh, so 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 you look at these you know these Jews that you despise so much, uh, they give you nothing but sorus. Uh, but for example, you're not willing to admit that the intelligence that you so dearly you know espouse, Mr. Alexander Portnoy, that might have had something to do with your upbringing as well. So even even if you accept the the the, the very premise as Roth set it up, it's 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 flimsy at best. But but the problem to me isn't that. Uh, the problem is truly metaphysical. The problem is that. He seems to wish that there was some sort, he writes, maybe we'll get to this later in, in, in The Counterlife, I think, you know, England has made a Jew out of me in, in you know, eight weeks. Uh, a, a Jew, you know, I, it made a Jew out of me like, like an apple is an apple or a glass is a glass is an object, you know. And, and, and I think that, that what we see in his work again and again is, is, this, is this maddening ambition uh, to reduce... It's not so much a metaphysical or, or rejection of the metaphysical as an, as an embrace of some magical quality that says, you know what would be great if I could be somehow Jewish without being Jewish. If I could not have this whole, you know, theology, history, trauma, chosenness, religion, God, Moses, Freud, you know, if I could not have any of that but still be something that I could call Jewish and affix to it only the things that were cool, that would be great. Now, that's, that's an, a very natural human reaction that I think we all have at, you know, seven or eight or nine. Uh, but, but at some point, no, no, I'm, I'm completely not kidding. But at some point, you know, even, even in, 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 in an intellectual way, and the same goes for sex, you know, young 
Young Boys, th there's this great line. I'm going to quote a lot of movies today just, you know, to leaven things up. There's this great line um, in, in uh, uh, Petty Chayefsky's, uh, you know, uh, famous movie in which um, uh, they're, I forget the characters' names, uh, the, 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 the producer and, um, and, and the young woman he's with. Um, care to remind me the, the actor's name? This network you're talking about? Yeah. Is it Faye Dunaway? Faye Dunaway, but but the 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 other gentleman's name. That I don't. Know. Yeah, thank you. Uh, they're 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 breaking up. He's breaking up with her, and she says something to him like, "Well, in the last couple of weeks, you couldn't get it up anyway." And he looks at her and he says, "This is designed to hurt me, but but I've abandoned this kind of logic, you know, in middle school." Uh, and, and that's exactly, exactly right to me, you know, talking about sex in such a way as the sum of all its urges is, is, is sad. It's just a sad statement. Uh, to, uh, more Washington pushback, right? Um, first of all, uh, you're right about Roth, the theology, the mitzvot, uh, the halakha, put it to the side, I agree. But there is a tremendous emphasis on the aunts and the uncles and the coming on Sunday for the bagel and the locks and the fathers and the mothers. The fact that Philip Roth himself uh, and Nathan Zuckerman and David Kapesh, or at least one of the David Kapeshes, could never reproduce and could never be paternal or maternal is one issue. But Roth, in many ways, valorizes a secular Jewish culture of aunts and uncles and grandmothers and grandfathers and getting together and moms who care about their children and children who are raised at the family table in Newark. And to you, Mr. Kirsch, right? In Operation Shylock, <laughs> if you wanted to look for it, out of nowhere, who would you see cited there? Origin and the doctrine of metempsychosis. As you recall, he has this incredible dream. Give me an M, give me an E, give me a T. Metempsychosis, I, I was trained as a Bible scholar. Right? I haven't seen metempsychosis ever discussed, save the work of James Joyce, by the way. And what is metempsychosis? The radical transmigration of souls. And as we read Operation Shylock and we look at Jinx Pazeski and the two Philip Roths, right? and this George Ziad, this Palestinian, we don't know if he's a collaborator, we start to understand that Roth is perhaps getting at something a little bit more profound. Now, granted, he's not in Meister Eckhart's Saul Bellow territory. He's not reading Meister Eckhart in the New York Public Library. Every, but I do think there's warrant for some uh, a philosophical defense of what Roth is after. With that said, let's quickly move to postmodernism. I'm going to go to Adam first because you have the most interesting formation. Right? In addition to your literary studies, you teach what I would call the computer and internet, and I'm sure I don't fully understand what it is, but postmodernism is there. Other, others have called it that too. The computer and internet. It's not my coinage. The Google. <laughs> I did not invent the internet, yeah. What do you see in Roth that connects with or plugs into this culture that you study as a scholar, right, of cybericity or whatever it might be called, what are the postmodern dimensions of Roth, which start to develop in 1974 with My Life as a Man, then they explode in the 1980s, and then comes the web. Anything you see there? Well, you know, there's, there's, there's this great um, definition of, of what, what postmodernism is by, by Umberto Eco. He said, you know, postmodernism is, is a man who wants to, to say to his girlfriend, you know, I love you madly. But he knows that she knows that these words were originally written by Barbara Cardlin. So uh, he won't say it to her. So all he could say is, uh, as you surely know, and as Barbara Carlin put it, I love you madly. Uh, now, now, there's this is this is funny, but it, but it's also kind of sad because because really what what they both get at that that they they do speak of love, but but they speak uh, more more profoundly of you know love in an age of lost innocence and and the the failure that they experience is their own. Uh, I I I see it in Roth in in. His fondness for for citations, uh, for borrowing, for setting up these uh, these constructs, uh, and and since you 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 began the introduction with with asking uh, cyberistically, yes, you know I, I think there is, and uh, the, the the most foolish thing you could do about anything is to say, oh, X is just like the internet, um, because there's there's a whole class of people who do it, uh, none of them too well, uh, but there's but there's something in Roth's work I think that is. Um, that is algorithmic. You know, he sets up, and 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 um, whether or not uh, you take it kindly uh, is is up to you. But but he very frequently uh, sets up a series of you know if then statements. Uh, he sets up constructs that are there to serve something that happens much much later 
in, in the plot. Now, uh, whether or not you 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 dig the vibrancy and 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 the beauty and the amusement of such constructs, or think that it's a cop out from from trying to actually grapple with a certain reality, that's that's a different thing. But it does have a very software type of logic to it. Uh, Adam, a lot of his postmodern fictional action consists of creating masks and misdirection and Zuckermans who seem to be Philip Roth and Philip Roth who seem uh, to be Philip Roth. Does this accrue to your greater reading pleasure? Now, it's 25 years after all of that. These techniques go way back. They go back to Cervantes. There's nothing new about this. You, as a very, very rich and sophisticated reader, when you see this nowadays, right, writers writing about writing, the classic metafictional description, what does it do for you? Well, I don't know about rich and sophisticated, but the, I don't usually like that kind of thing. And I'm surprised at how much of an appetite I have for it in Roth, how much patience I have for it in Roth. And as I said at the beginning, I think the reason is that for him, it's truly expressive. It's expressive of how he is in the world. Um, in one way, I think Roth is a lot like Susan Sontag in that they both came of age in the back, against the background of a very confident high culture dominated in large part by Jewish intellectuals. And they attacked it. They attacked it uh, in the name of libido, right? Sexuality uh, against interpretation. We need an erotics of art rather than interpretation. Roth could have agreed with that. Um, then they saw that culture collapse and disappear, and what came in its place was not something better, but in fact, a sort of non-culture, or pop culture, or mass culture. And Sontag, uh, for one, recanted a lot of what she said in the 60s about attacking high culture. And I think for Roth, too, there's always an implicit assumption that literature is the most valuable thing, that he belongs to this a central tradition of serious literature, um, that that's how he sees himself, uh, that he is as much Lanoff as he is Zuckerman. And when he is playful and joking and uh, using sleight of hand and trying to trick you about who he is and is he Philip Roth or is he one of the avatars or which Philip Roth is he in, in Operation Shylock. Um, I think that he wants or he takes it as read that he is a serious person, that he is serious about culture, about almost religious about culture. So he's not postmodern in the sense of undermining hierarchy. And that's why I think he gets away with it. I agree. I, I, I'd, I'd like, I promise to talk about movies. I'd, I'd like to sort of share an anecdote that I think actually, you know, brings, brings this to the fore. There's a famous story about the making of, of the movie The Marathon Man. Uh, there, if you, you don't, haven't seen it or don't recall it, it, it revolves around this one very graphic scene in which uh, an alleged or it turns out an actual uh, Nazi doctor uh, drills using sort of a drill uh, the, the teeth of a, of a young student played by Dustin Hoffman and the dentist uh, is played by Laurence Olivier. And so they're shooting the scene and, and uh, Hoffman is sort of like, you know, the method actor of all method actors. And it's, it's, they're supposed to start shooting at one and it's 1.15, it's 1.30, it's three, it's four, it's six. Uh, finally, around eight, he shows up and he's all disheveled and sweating and his clothes are all untied. And, and they ask him, you know, what the hell happened? And he said, well, you know, I'm a method actor. I was getting into character. And Olivia looks at him and says, my dear boy, um, may I suggest you have a nice cup of tea, a long nap, then wake up and start acting. And, okay, so uh, just explain to me the... My dear boy, right. <laughs> may I suggest right. <laughs> you have a nice snap. Uh, abandon, abandon the tomfoolery, if I may channel uh, the Olivier, <laughs> and, and start writing. Because, because here's the other thing what? that I reject. No, no, but Leo, get this to, the thing. what get, do you get, want him to do? I, Tell I, me, I, what I, do you want this all I to do? I want him to be all he could be. Right. Uh, just what the army, I suspect. So you know, 29 novels are uh, not enough. No, because because it's not... Every the, pen award imaginable. Every The Man Booker Award. Everything but the goddamn freaking Nobel uh, Prize. Are we right? judge, and uh, it's not enough for Leo Lieber. Are we Explain judging, it. Are we judging according to awards now? Is, well, is I mean, uh, you know, when you win that many awards, and many people are not favorably disposed oh to Lord. Philip Roth, I know this as an academician. He is not taught in many universities for a variety of reasons, right? Uh, I am not trained in comparative literature. I'm teaching Philip Roth at Georgetown University because nobody in the English department is particularly interested in him. That's the way it's been my entire and, career. And why, People why, don't want to teach Push back, push back, uh, Washington push back to you. Why do Please. you suppose that is? Um, and I'll tell you why that is. Because Roth 
very early on acquired the reputation of being the white, heterosexual, patriarchal, misogynist from hell. And it might have been deserved. In fact, it was deserved. As a consequence, many of the scholars that came to inhabit the postmodern and postcolonial university English department were not receptive or impervious to the charms of the very gifted Mr. Roth. That's my explanation for it. But it's unusual how now, now, few people now are. Hold on here. Um, when Herzog mm -hmm. stands on the train platform and he sees a woman who reminds him of his, I'm going to botch this terribly, who reminds him of, of, of his ex wife, he says something like, Look at that bitch with her bitch eyes and her bitch hair, et cetera, et cetera. Bitch, 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 right. bitch. We, we treated Saul Bellow nicely. Yeah. But, they, but he's not taught things. either. He's not what? He's not taught either. He's not taught either, right? Uh, Bellow, you know, I mean, we can, when uh, in Mr. Sandler's Planet, when he looks at his daughter and he says, she has fucked out eyes, right? And wow, right? Uh, when uh, Dr. Gruner looks at Angela, there is a degree of misogyny as well in Bella, and I agree with Adam. If you do a survey of who is taught in English departments, there'll be a lot more, as Amy Bellett points out in the exit goes, there'll be a lot more Toni Morrison uh, than there will be Philip Roth, and we need not have that particular debate right now. So let's go back to our original scrum, because now it's turned into, from pushback into a scrum. <laughs> um, what do you want from the man? All right, I, I agree. The awards are a criteria, but not the final criteria, right? Um, has he ever achieved the form, the perfect good, right, that uh, Uliel think, it, what's the closest he's come? Well, I, I'll, I'll answer the question simply. I want him to be interested in us. In us. Us. In. Uh, the world, Americans, Jews, uh, as, as, as they are, uh, you know, his neighbors, his friends, his country the politics, women. I, I want him to be engaged with this because I think he's a terrifically talented writer. And Plot Against America doesn't do that. Uh, American pastoral doesn't... Do, no, doesn't American indignation, is, which is, looks is, at the is, Korean War. Look, uh, American pastoral is a very... I have not read Indignation. Mm -hmm. American pastoral is, is a very... There, there, there are two... This is, this is you know... <laughs> I have this at my disposal. Uh, two quotes that, that I absolutely love. They happen to be from American pastoral in the quote against America. Uh, for American Pastoral, this is the last uh, line of the novel. They'll never recover. Everything is against them. Everyone and everything that is not like their life. Now, the first lines of The Plot Against America. Fear presides over these memories, a perpetual fear. Come on now. <laughs> Come on now. Mm. Not all 60s radicals were cardboard cutout Mary, uh, you know, uh, Levovs. Uh, you know, n n even if you set up this, this environment of, of a Lindbergh presidency, even if you set up this environment of a Clinton presidency, it wasn't like that, man. It's your prerogative to explore this territory, but to say this was a country and the, in, the, in the sort of throes of uh, moralistic outrage, no, it wasn't. It was actually reserved to a very, very, very small uh, population of the public. And to come up and say it because it's really an easy, great backdrop for you to have your pretty little novel against, that's just intellectually dishonest, man. All right, good. We're scrumming. It's and it's because he over-identifies mm -hmm. with Clinton. Yeah. Because he, he sees himself in the same. Rather great fornicating white man. Right, exactly. All right. Exactly. I think we're getting someplace. It's heating up. All right. Let's move to sentences. And I'm just going to ask Corinna to take us to Henry James. Uh, this was quite well scripted. So what I regret uh, as an English professor, uh, which I'm not, by the way. I'm actually a Bible scholar. Uh, but what I regret is how little we actually look at uh, form nowadays. We're always speaking about themes and whatnot. And I like to break things down. So we put up some quotes just to compare the quintessential sentence of other writers with that of Roth. I'm going to ask uh, Liel uh, to read this one. It's a beauty, all right? It's from uh, Henry James. It's from What Maisie Knew. It's handpicked by uh, Professor Leibovitz. Uh, Liel, you are a member of my acting troupe, the Professor Berliner Blau Players. Give us your dramatic reading. We've actually rehearsed these as a group. Here we, we go. have. Uh, you'll, you'll forgive me. <clears throat> so a very quick setup. Uh, this is written by or, or spoken or, 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 or through the, the eyes of, of a, a young girl named Maisie who's 
probably around eight uh, or nine when these lines are spoken. Uh, her parents are a sort of, you know, late 19th century, uh, wealthy, educated version of the Kardashians. They're, they're horrible, moneyed people who are fornicating left and right. Her father had just left her mother with Miss Overmeyer, who is, who is her former nanny, who is young and very attractive. Her mother married uh, some, some, um, some royalty who, uh, at some point later in the book, both of these new spouses would, would leave and and uh, hook up with one another. It's, it's a whole kind of romantic twist. And, and uh, Maisie uh, is in the care of Mrs. Wicks, uh, who, is, who is her nanny, uh, whose daughter uh, had died some years prior. It was an account of these things that Mama got her for such low pay, really for nothing. So much one day when Mrs. Wicks had accompanied her into the drawing room and left her, the child heard one of the ladies she found there a lady with eyebrows arched like skipping ropes and thick black stitching like ruled lines from musical notes on beautiful white gloves announced to another. She knew governesses were poor. Miss Overmore was unmentionably and Miss Wicks ever so publicly so. Neither this, however, nor the old brown frock or the diadem nor the button made a difference for Maisie and the charm put forth through everything. The charm of Mrs. Wicks conveying that somehow in her ugliness and her poverty, she was peculiarly and soothingly safe, safer than anyone in the world, than papa, than mama, than the lady with the arched eyebrows, safer even, though so much less beautiful, than Miss Overmore, on whose loveliness, as she supposed it, the little girl was faintly conscious that one couldn't rest with quite the same tucked in and kiss for good night feeling. Mrs. Wicks was as safe as Clara Matilda, who was in heaven, and yet, embarrassingly, also in Kensal Green, where they had been together to see her little huddled grave. Can we have a round of applause for Henry James? Because, come on. Yeah, but you know, when I was at the new school and we used to read <laughs> Max Weber in German, we used to kind of like, what's the sentence about? And we used to go on and we used to translate. And sometimes with James, I find myself asking, well, what, where are we again? What's the sentence about? I, I, I understand the, the technical beauty of the sentence. Not my cup of tea. Let's go to Virginia Woolf now and let's have Adam take a crack at that one. Uh, here we go. A Adam, would you? Remove one sentence. And so this is nonfiction and shorter. Mm -hmm. um, as I have said already that it was an October day, I dare not forfeit your respect and imperil the fair name of fiction by changing the season and describing lilacs hanging over garden walls, crocuses, tulips, and other flowers of spring. Fiction must stick to facts, and the truer the facts, the better the fiction. So we are told. Amen. Wasn't handpicked. Nice. Yeah. What do you feel? How do, how do you feel about that? One? Um, well, it's funny. Uh, there's the Roth book, The Facts. Mm -hmm. um, I think. I mean, if we're talking about style, we'll get. Well, I, I won't. I'll withhold comment till we get to the Roth example, and then we'll talk about style. All right. Here we go. We have another one. This is from Updike. Uh, I picked this one out from Rabbit Run. Leo, would you do the honors? Uh, sure. Well. The clangor of the body shop comes up softly. Its noise comforts him, tells him he is hidden and safe. While he hides, men are busy nailing the world down, and toward the disembodied sounds his heart makes in darkness a motion of love. Mm. You always feel that the Updikean sentence is edging towards poetry, which is why I am in awe of Updike. You feel that there's a little clause in there, which is poetic. Uh, you do not concur? I, I will not dare test our friendship, well, Jacques, by, by, by speaking my mind about John Updike. Well, we have a poet here. So when you read Updike, what, what do you... Yeah, I think it's poetic in the bad way. I mean, it's... it's <laughs> when you say something is, is poetic or literary, uh, that's what you're talking about. That it's, it's, it's caressing, it's self-pleasuring, it's not discovering. Um, it's sort of reveling in these soft associations. You have words like softly, comforts, safe, hidden, um, and also always this sort of religiosity, this religios tone that you get with Updike, where you look at something and because you can describe it, therefore you've got God somehow has appeared on the scene. Good, I like that. What's wrong with that, by the way? Uh, speaking as an atheist, what is, what is wrong with that? Um, that it's too easily earned. The, the sort of metaphysical consolation is too easily earned. So you need like an entire Babylonian Talmud worth of, of words to get to God? Is that what you're saying? Well, maybe it's just that I don't think that you can get there. That um, I, I believe, I don't believe you can get there and I'm more, most convinced by writing that is honest about that. And that's something that Roth is, is uh, very honest about. I mean, talking about the secular Jewish predicament, one thing that he is deeply is secular um, to the point that 
when it comes to writing about last things, as he has in his most recent books, like Death, uh, he's not equipped for them because he doesn't have a language to talk about death. Um, and so for him, death always comes back to, you can't get it up. That's really, that's, that's the great <laughs> crisis of all of the men in his last novels of the last 15 years is impotence. And not to you know, denigrate that as a crisis, but the way he, he sort of uses it as a stand-in for death, right? That this is the ultimate test, this is the humbling, right? The humbling is, you can't have sex anymore, um, I think is, is exposes something trivial at the heart of his metaphysics. The humbling is that you can't perform anymore, right? right. Roth, Roth is a theorist of performativity, right? There is no core to you. What we do is we perform. And what right. Simon Axler can't do is he loses his stagecraft and he loses his magic as an actor, right? right. It's not just about cocks and dicks and whatnot. Uh, I think there's a little more. Uh, going. Well, it's like 80% about that. Yeah, okay. Not much. Okay, so the next slide, Thomas Mann, The Wonderkind. Uh, I'm going to read this one because I'm so uh, fond of it. Uh, he has the artist's grandeur and his lack of dignity, his charlatry and his holy spark, his scorn and his secret rapture. But I mustn't write that. It's too good. Ah, believe me, I'd have become an artist myself if I didn't see through all this so clearly. Which brings us now to Roth's, Roth's quintessential sentence, I think, from the Ghost Rider. I thought about this for a while. I think this one gets us to it. Liel, would you do uh, the honors? For you, Jacques, I will. Thank you. Virtuous reader, if you think that after intercourse or al all animals are sad, try masturbating on the daybed in E.I. Lawn of study and see how you feel when it's over. I have not tried myself. <laughs> So what did we learn looking at these uh, five four modernist masters and Roth? Uh, is there a lesson to be learned from this comparative study of uh, sentences? I, I think what it comes down to is that Roth is not great because he's a stylist. He's not a great stylist. And I think that he belongs more in a different tradition of American fiction where if it's James versus Dreiser, he belongs more on the Dreiser side. Mm -hmm. That what he's great at, and, and Celine, as Liel mentioned, Celine is a big influence on him. What he's great at is, is a tirade. Um, he's, he doesn't have a wide register, and his sentences are inelegant often. Um, they're piled on, lots of words piled up together. The syntax is not complicated usually. Um, you don't read Roth for beautiful sentences the way you might read Updike, for instance, for beautiful sentences. I would agree. Veronica Geng, who's a name that some of you might know, a literary editor, fiction editor for The New Yorker, I found the correspondence in the Library of Congress where she said something about Roth which I thought was very interesting. She was congratulating him on the publication of The Ghost Writer, which was originally published in The New Yorker, and she said his writing had the powerful resonance of the human voice. And I don't think this contradicts anything you just said. It reads as if someone is speaking more than as if someone is writing, when it is good, I wish to say. Leo, do you want to chime in on that? Um, well, to me, that's like when someone tries to compliment my writing and telling me, by telling me it's very cinematic. Mm -hmm. uh, that's usually when I, when I you know, try to throttle them. Could we, could, we, could we move back to, to the James uh, for, sure. for a second? Uh, could, could we actually pull it up? Uh, is that too much to ask? Yes. Uh, j just very briefly. Uh, now, look, I am, I'm very uh, uh, thrilled and, and, and you know, always pleased to have Adam uh, you know, in the world, but, but on the stage, because Adam is really you know, both an incredibly uh, smart and also an incredibly kind critic, which you really don't find uh, you know, almost ever. Uh, but but, but this, is, this is what I mean. I'm, I'm willing to give up a lot by way of sentence construction, and I can think of a lot of writers like Dostoevsky, for example, who write as a craft pretty fucking horribly, uh, but who have some sort of, of insight uh, in, into, into humanity. And, and, and here, for example, is this insight. I'm, I'm, I'm indebted to James Wood, who, who brought this to my attention in a book. Um, he, what you see in this very short sentence is, is really you know, three or four things. Uh, you see you know, Maisie conveying the perspective of uh, the adults she's overheard by saying things like, oh, she got it for such a low pay, really for nothing, sort of just repeating what she's overheard. Uh, you have Maisie sort of conveying the perspective of, of uh, the adults that she's trying to understand, like all governesses are poor. And then you have Maisie actually speaking her mind, saying, but I feel safe with her. I feel safer than her than with anyone else. This is a writer going outside of his own head. This is a writer connecting to humanity. This is a writer who cares 
Uh, that's all I ask for. That or failing miserably en route to that. Okay, all right, we're gonna skip over because I feel we're uh, lingering too much on the prurient dimensions of Roth's work. Let's go now to the Jewish predicament. Let's get to that. Um, the Jewish problematics are many. Uh, and let's start with Zionism. Liel, you're uh, an Israeli, though your English uh, does not uh, suggest that to anyone. You speak so beautifully. Yeah, thank you very much for this. <laughs> <laughs> let's take this quote. I'm going to ask Adam to read it. It comes from The Counter Life. And that, along with Operation Shylock, is Roth's greatest penetration into the problematics of Zionism. Uh, Adam? I was the American-born grandson of simple Galician tradesmen who at the end of the last century had on their own reached the same prophetic conclusion as Theodore Herzl, that there was no future for them in Christian Europe. But instead of struggling to save the Jewish people from destruction by founding a homeland in a remote corner of the Ottoman Empire that had once been biblical Palestine, they simply set out to save their own Jewish skins. Inasmuch as Zionism meant taking upon oneself rather than leaving to others responsibility for one's survival as a Jew, this was their brand of Zionism and it worked. Is that a legitimate form of Zionism? No. It's not just not a legitimate form of Zionism. It's not a legitimate form of thinking. Uh, you know, I want to be very brief so not to repeat anything I said, but you know, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who's right, we always bring him up in conversations such as these, uh, said, said I think the most pertinent thing to this discussion, you cannot follow a rule privately. Uh, this is what he's trying to do in all of his works, but, but in sentences like this. And it works in Shylock because he does it, you know, because it's fun. Uh, but you can't be a private Zionist or a private Jew. Uh, you're a member of a community and an ideology and a belief, and you have to reckon with that. You have to grapple with that. It's true that in Portnoy's complaint, uh, in one of the overlooked, uh, one of the funniest and most overlooked sentences, uh, as Portnoy contemplates his great loneliness and despair, he thinks back to a victory garden that he used to grow back in the war. This is just as about uh, as uh, Naomi is about to kick him in the head after his attempted rape. And he comes up with one line, which I think is very much in line with what you just said. He says, my kibbutz. All right? He thinks about that little victory garden, and he refers to it as my kibbutz. Mm -hmm. right? And this idea of creating a personal one-man sort of mm -hmm. Judaism, I do think haunts Roth's thinking about Zionism and about uh, the future of the Jewish people. Let's see what happens. Oh, it's yeah. really a one-man universe, I mean, when you look at it. It's a universe that doesn't easily uh, offer a, a roadmap or a blueprint right, to a Jewish future. I would mm -hmm. concur with you on that. Adam? Yeah, I mean, one of the big themes of Roth's work is the bad conscience of American Jews faced by Israeli Jews. That, and that is one of the reasons why he's such an important chronicler of American Jewish life and probably the great novelist about American Jewish life in the second half of the 20th century is that he gets all the all the raw nerves, all the exposed nerves, and he, he knows exactly where they are and he grabs them. And that's true from the very beginning from those stories, right? Defender of the Faith and the Conversion of the Jews and Eli the Fanatic. He, he knows just what Jews are um, sensitive about and upset about and he pounces on it. And that's especially true when it comes to Israel in this book and in Operation Shylock, that this is all very defensive. I mean, the tone of this is extremely defensive because Zionism has such prestige for American Jews that it's this sort of saying, well, you know, I might not be a Zionist, but I've done something that contributed to Jewish welfare, Jewish survival, um, even though it, I agree that it's specious and it's not, it's not a real argument, it's not real logic. Is there, for both of you, is there a heroism to being a Jew in America, which is less than the heroism of being a Jew in Israel? No. I think that there's never been, it's never taken less heroism to be a Jew than it does in America today. It's never taken less than it presently does. Yeah. Leo? Uh, I, I, what can I say? I'm a simple Jew. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the task of being a simple Jew is always and everywhere demanding. Is in every? Always and everywhere demanding. Even in America? Yes. Okay. Uh, to, to, to do it seriously. Uh, to, to refuse um, to refuse the, the billboards, you know, to refuse the, the, the road signs, to refuse these, these callings of, well, that's what we're about, uh, to refuse this oversimplification, uh, to actually grapple with it, uh, to think about it, not as, you know, a, a flavor 
uh, not as an afterthought, but as the central core being of, 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 of your entire existence, uh, is a very demanding thing. Cynthia Ozick says a Jew is a person who draws distinctions. That's the essence <laughs> of Judaism. Are we a distinction-drawing people? Is that it? Um, I'm always distrustful of those kinds of formulations. There's a, there's something. But this a little, is Cynthia, after all. It is, but you can trust Cynthia. There's something a little proud about it. I mean, it's it implies that Jews like distinctions more than other people. I'm not sure if you could make that case, but I mean, Ozick is someone who's very interesting to read and look at next to Roth mm -hmm. because she um, is also a very Jewish writer, obviously, but in a different, a, in a completely different way. I was surprised that on the paperback of Portnoy's Complaint is a quote from Cynthia right. Ozick. He's our bravest writer. Yeah. Saying he's our bravest, he's writer, our bravest writer, which you wouldn't necessarily expect, at least I wouldn't. Yeah. And one wouldn't expect that from an orthodox Jewish person, right? To look at that and say, this is really uh, heroic. Okay, let's go to what I think is the Sir Lawrence Olivier monologue uh, in all of Roth's work. And this is his very peculiar disquisition in the mouth of one Mossad agent by the name of Smilesberger on the Chofetz Chaim. Uh, who's going to read it? Is it going to be Liel or is it going to be Adam? Are you going to read it? I think it's Adams. All right, here we go. He died at 93 in Poland, the year that you were born in America. It is he who formulated the detailed laws of speech for our people and tried to cure them of the bad habits of centuries. The Chofetz Chaim formulated the laws of evil speech, or Lashon Hara, or I guess I should say Lashon Hara, the laws that forbid Jews making derogatory or damaging remarks about their fellow Jews, even if they are true. If they are false, of course, it's worse. It's forbidden to speak Lashon Hara, and it is forbidden even to listen to Lashon Hara, even if you don't believe it. In his old age, the Chofetz Chaim extolled his deafness because it prevented him from hearing Lashon Hara. The poor Chofetz Chaim was an anti-defamation league unto himself, only to get Jews to stop defaming one another. But he loved his people and could not bear to see them brought low by their chattering mouths. He could not stand their quarreling, and so he set himself the impossible task of promoting Jewish harmony and Jewish unity instead of bitter Jewish divisiveness. Why couldn't the Jews be one people? Why must Jews be in conflict with one another? Why must they be in conflict with themselves? Because the divisiveness is not just between Jew and Jew, it is within the individual Jew. Is there a more manifold personality in all the world? I don't say divided. Divided is nothing. Even the goyim are divided. But inside every Jew, there is a mob of Jews. The good Jew, the bad Jew, the new Jew, the old Jew, the lover of Jews, the hater of Jews, the friend of the goy, the enemy of the goy, the arrogant Jew, the wounded Jew, the pious Jew, the rascal Jew, the coarse Jew, the gentle Jew, the defiant Jew, the appeasing Jew, the Jewish Jew, the de -Jew, Jew. Shall I go on? Yeah. That deserves a round of applause. All right. Um. Let's look at that one. All right, let's look at that one. There's a lot in Roth about the mouth, by the way. Uh, in the anatomy lesson, remember at the very end when he cracks his head on a Jewish gravestone and his mouth is wired shut, right? Mordechai Lipman, Lipman, right? In the counter life, right? Uh, there's a lot about words and mouths and mouths being shut. Tell me a little bit about the talk, the blather, the 29 novels, the incessant garrulousness of Philip Roth versus what the Chofetz Chaim is prescribing for the Jewish people. Yeah. I'd actually like to hear, I, I'm not copying out, I promise a reply, but I actually would like to hear Adam first in this. Um, um, well, I think, I mean, the irony, of course, and he, he puts it front and center, is that that is what he is accused of and has been accused of from the beginning, is evil speech, speaking evil about the Jews. And that um, accusation has sort of dogged him throughout his career. I think you hear it less now than you did in the 50s and 60s and 70s, but his guilt about that is enormous, and uh, it doesn't stop him from writing the way he does, but he works the guilt into the fiction. So there's the famous thing in The Ghost Rider where there's the letter from the judge where it's a questionnaire, and the questionnaire has questions like, would you have published these stories in Nazi Germany? What makes you different from Goebbels and Julius Stryker? And, um, he, and, and those are, I think, based, and that's based, I think, on a real letter that he really got. Um, so this is his sort of ironic saying, here's someone who is dedicated to wiping out evil speech, and what is Philip Roth's whole career is evil speech. Yeah, I believe it was the critic Maria Serkin that uh, initially launched that accusation at him. So is there anything to Philip Roth's rendering of the Chofetz Chaim that he should just shut his yapper for the good of the Jewish people, or is that a completely off premise? Well, I think that the other premise and, and this gets back to your previous question about heroism, is that Roth knows that the Jews are completely safe in America. Mm. And that's why he can 
say these things because he doesn't actually think that it's going to harm anyone. And in fact, it hasn't. And here we all are celebrating him, right, as a, as a Jewish writer. Um, he, in the counter life, there's the thing about the brother going to, to Judea, the Judea section of the novel, and, the, and Lippmann, the fanatic uh, settler leader, says that Jews in the diaspora are living on a volcano. And he says to his brother, is that what it felt like to you in northern New Jersey? Were you living on a volcano? And he says, no. Um, and I think that Roth knows that, and that's why he brings up these Nazi parallels because he's saying, look at the sort of inherent absurdity of this. Of course, this is not the situation that we're in. When you read the Shuki Elkanon character in The Counterlife who writes a letter in that third chapter aloft and he says, don't talk about Lippmann. Don't write about Lippmann for your American audience. Please, please don't. This is real for us, right? And what your Congress will do when they read about a Lippmann, it's going to affect our lives and the work. Just shut up and don't talk about it. Do you sympathize with Shuki Elkanon that this American uh, interloper completely misunderstands the situation, fictionalizes it, and makes things really, really complicated for Israelis? Do you, were you giving him an attaboy when you heard Shuki Elkanon uh, writing that? Well, for, Zuckerman? First of all, it's, it's worth noting, and Adam and I were talking about it just now, that, that he's not really read in Israel. Uh, Israelis, you know, I, I have this recollection of going to you know, the library in my high school asking for you know, some Jewish writers. and. And they said, well, yeah, we got Amos Oz, we got, you know, I'll fit your show, we got all these guys. I said, well, I've, I've heard of, of Bello and, and these guys. Do you have any of them? I said, why would you want to read Bello? Like, read Brenner. Like, they're, they're of, of us. Um, to answer your question, I would say yes, uh, but metaphysically so. Uh, and and here's, here's how, uh, because I felt that the whole thing uh, was a setup. Uh, because I felt that there wasn't actually a sense of engagement with this question. If I felt if he truly that he truly cared, uh, uh, whether or not he was he was a part. Uh, if I felt that he truly cared, that there was a specific community dealing with specific problems, uh, in specific ways. Uh, if I thought that he really cared that that community had uh, historical traumas that were not possible to just, you know, wipe away and say, oh, these are all just neurotic, you know, crazy, you know, overbearing mothers and henpecked husbands. If I felt that he truly care, uh, cared about that, I, I would take, as an artist, you know, uh, I, I would take him much more seriously. And you me. feel he doesn't care about the Israeli predicament, the Jewish predicament, he's just fictionalizing because that's what he does? Right, and, and, and this is, again, this is why to me, you know, The Plot Against America was, was sort of like a supremely boring book because there was, no, there was no urgency in it. There was no sense of someone who truly has a stake in the outcome of this of nightmarish, you know, American Cossack uh, situation occurring. Uh, it was just a, a thought exercise. Uh, it was just a formulation. And you need a Shuki al Kanan in that situation saying, don't tell the others because that makes it like, oh my God. By the way, the don't tell the others appears in almost every book or, or, or in many books. Operation Shylock has the Mossad agent saying to him at the end, by the way, don't mention that you are on a special mission in Athens and, and you don't have anything in the book about that. So you're sort of like beginning to wonder what else you know, was left out. So yeah, the don't tell the others is a really, to me, very childish kind of literary device is, oh, by the way, we're doing something really secret here. And, and the kid is like, secret? I, I like secrets. So you're extending your indictment. I mean, the indictment has gotten broader, right? Uh, not only is he kind of a mediocre writer who hasn't achieved the full bloom of his talent, he just doesn't really care. He doesn't profoundly well, he, care he about the subjects that he's writing he about. He is one because he is the other. They're inseparable to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I know that's a that's a that's an extremely unfashionable, you know, conservative, boring charge to weigh in the year two thousand thirteen in, in the grand city of New York against someone. But I'm sorry, you know, I believe in that and I care about these themes uh, deeply. They're in my life. Uh, they're not a joke to me. Uh, a writer, a Jewish writer who really cares, a contemporary, give us a, a standard by which to measure Roth. Every Every phoneme of every word speaks concern. And well, you know, you know the, 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 the thing that I <laughs> sort of neglected to, to mention, if we're on indictments, if I may, uh, the, the problem isn't so much, uh, or, or, or the solution isn't so much to find someone to compare Roth with. with it's, it's rather asking, you know, what has Roth wrought? And, and you know, I look at uh, everything that's odious to me about contemporary culture, uh, things like, you know, HBO's Girls. 
everything that is navel gazing and self obsessed and 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 completely you know solipsistic i see his shadow there uh, i think that there is a reason that there hasn't been anyone past him because he put up such an amazingly and to an extent woody allen as well right i mean they put out such an extensively lucrative and appealing model like hey guys and girls you could just rant you don't have to be a part of a tradition not cool, not sexy. You don't have to be a part of a community. You don't have to believe it in it. You just have to talk about your cock for a while. Uh, and then you have to be very funny. And then if someone says something, just call them squares and say it's satire. And you're pretty much on your way. And, and there's a lot of that going on in literature and in TV. And, and you know what? I don't see anything or anyone. Uh, it, it's easy for me to you know, cry and say, Bello, Bello. I think Bello is an unbelievable genius, the likes of which we shall probably never see again. But that's an easy conversation. Yeah, but you know, your Belavian protagonist is a person that stands at this huge distance from the world, yes, understands right. it, and can't do a thing about it, right? Exactly. Every Belavi just watching him, getting it, figuring out what's wrong, and has right. no capacity right. whatsoever to affect change. Just, just say it. By the way, who, who said that great line, you know, that, that Bella was, was this great writer precisely because, you know, he's never really lived as a human? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think that's there's truth to that. Well, I you still know, admire him. They're not ways. all supposed to be like Bobble, right? I mean, the ability to write isn't just a function of sweeping in on the plane uh, behind a bunch of marauding Cossacks, right, and seeing the blood and smelling it, right? That can't be the sole criteria for the ability to produce incandescent literature, right? So I think I want to exonerate Bellow and Roth. I mean, they just haven't lived through that sort of thing, right? Oh, I, 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 I completely don't think that matters. You know, I, I, I've just finished a book about another great, great uh, rabbi, uh, Ray Leonard Cohen of Montreal. Um, and, and when he was young, he had uh, the very similar uh, you know, problem, that, that he faced a similar problem that, that you're, you're uh, describing now. He, he figured out uh, that, that there was a Lorca, uh, and he reads Lorca, and he says to himself, almost in exasperation, holy fuck, that guy had... <laughs> And a civil war. That guy had everything going for him. He'd go to Havana. He could live. I'm in Montreal. What's going on? And and it took him a while. But but being someone who's you know who's 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 whose particles are truly you know whose pores are are open to receive the particles of the divine. Uh, someone who realized that that grandeur is everywhere. It's in every speck of human life. And to look at human life and to say, oh no, I'm going to die, that's not fair. That's taking it in, in, in its most based, truly vulgar way. Well, if you read The Dying Animal, you will read a one paragraph description of a vagina <laughs> by Philip Roth, right? Unfortunately, we don't have it here. Uh, my students have always harped on it and they've been extremely impressed by it. Uh, I wish I could read it to you. If anybody has The Dying Animal, we can pull out the passage right now. Um, Aesthetically, philosophically, spiritually, from the point of view of good fiction, if you trust me that it really is quite a beautiful passage, right? What's wrong with the depiction of a vagina? What's wrong with it? Is it just not, it's just we can't categorize it as legitimate literature because it's this kind of uh, fetishizing of an organ? Look, of course we can. I, 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 I realize full well that I, that I walk a very fine line of coming off like a complete Bolshevik here. Uh, but, but, but I am sorry. Uh, I am rather conservative in my opinions. I am, I am a, a, you know, again, a simple God-fearing Jew. And for me, not just literature, but every act of life uh, has at some point to take into consideration the embitterment of the human condition. And if it doesn't, it's a neat pastime, uh, but it's not worthy of anything uh, by way of serious canonization or discussion. So in a sense, you know, my problem really isn't that much, to be perfectly honest, with Philip Roth. My problem is really with us. You know, uh, we who have made him into one of only three living authors to have received you know, a Library of America edition in his lifetime. Uh, and, and I was telling Adam before, or, or maybe it, it was you too, I, I think the, the, the greatest uh, uh, revenge to all that, uh, or on all that uh, reputation, would be that in three or 400 years, people would, would pick up these books and they will try to read them. And I, am, I, am, I, am, I will be dead, uh, hopefully, long, long, long. <laughs> Uh, since, but I would be very surprised uh, if they held up. All right, uh, let's go to pastorals very quickly as we start to wind it down. I'm going to go to you on this one because I think this brings a lot together. Uh, Roth is an anti 
pastoralist. Let's look at, uh, that is his philosophy, by the way. This goes back to all the disagreements that Liel and I are having, which are the same disagreements that Roth had with Howe, and the same disagreements that Joseph Epstein had with a critic by the name of Mark Schechner, right? So once his tragedy, twice his comedy, whatever. All right, here we go. The pastoral landscape par excellence, according to one school, it's where the pastoral genre that you speak of begins. Those irrepressible yearnings by people beyond simplicity to be taken off the perfectly safe, charmingly simple and satisfying environment that is desire's homeland. How moving and pathetic these pastorals are that cannot admit contradiction or conflict. Okay, Adam, that cannot admit contradiction or conflict. Yeah, and for him, that's his childhood always, that he's very sentimental about his childhood. And the fact that his childhood perfectly coincided with the years leading up to and during World War II um, makes it very easy for him to map American innocence onto the innocence of his own childhood. Um, that's why I think I actually quite liked Plot Against America. I thought that was one of his best books of the last 15 years, 20 years. Um, and the reason why is that, unlike Liel, I, I feel like there really is a personal sense of threat in that book. And where the threat comes in is he's taking this very pastoral phase of his existence, the childhood, the protected years, um, and saying, well, what if we had dealt, what if we Jews in America had dealt with the kind of thing that Jews in Europe were dealing with and how that would have completely destroyed the supposition of his whole life, which is that America is a benevolent place and that Jewish fate in America can be thought about playfully because it's a safe place. Um, and especially the fact that that book was written in the aftermath of 9-11, I thought was made it very um, powerful at that particular moment. Uh, many of his books will have the same details about uh, going to the Jersey Shore in the summer and the older brother who takes care of him and the parents who work hard. And for him, childhood is the pastoral moment. And adulthood is, is the time when contradictions come in and the main contradiction is sex. Okay, what about, Leal, I'm gonna ask you, I find in Roth, the pastoral is the preferred genre of the Goyim. Uh, it's a Christian genre. It's not something that Jews can easily believed to be true. Think of the character of Maria Zuckerman who writes about the mists and the farmers and the green grass of England. And Nathan Zuckerman uh, scores her for this, right? He lights her up as saying, life isn't about strifeless unity, the womb dream of the pastoral, he calls it. Is there something to the idea, Liel, that the anti-pastoral, the view that life is betrayal, is shit, is lying, is deceit, is unknowability, is there something to Roth's, I think, deep conviction that this is something Jews, because of their unique historical, ex historical experiences, have understood, and the Goyim, as he calls them, have not. I'm tempted to say yes, mm. uh, but, but, but the, the reason why I'm being guarded is because while I agree with the key premise, I think that his handling of it, uh, as I think, might have been made evident by previous things I have said in the past hour, um, is lacking, and, and, and I, I'd like to think of another Jew who, who handles the, the transition uh, from, from the pastoral to the anti-pastoral, uh, which is Proust, uh, who is my, you know, my beloved. Uh, there is tenderness in conflict, uh, and there is never, uh, to speak of, a moment of, of true pastoralness, uh, not even for the Goyim. Right, uh, there is always uh, the 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 beginnings, the cracks of of discord, even in the most beautiful and charming and and innocent childhood memory. This is why you know Proust's book begin with a great big trauma of you know Mama leaving the room, putting the child to sleep, and his 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 you know palpable fear. Um, Roth doesn't see that. Uh, for him, it's a it's a black and white. It's a it's a sort of like you like X, I like Y. Uh, I believe in conflict because I'm brave and I'm honest, and that's what honest life is. It's shit and conflict and death and cock, and, and you believe in horses in the mist. You have evidence to the contrary, that it's not uh, that, shit that and like, conflict. Uh, yeah, uh, leave the cock out of it for now. But I, I, I will, Please I, adduce your, your findings. Do, do I have uh, evidence to the contrary? Um, I do, uh, and the reason that I do, and, and I think really this entire conversation probably could, could, could be boiled down in some, in some really uh, archaic way, I think, to the question of belief in God. Uh, you know, uh, to me, if, if, if your 
uh, existence uh, is guided uh, from the heavens, uh, you see things very differently. If it's not, I'm not saying it's impossible, not in the least. Uh, there have been, there are, there will be uh, people whose, whose life is, is earth-based, uh, who continue to see things in, in, in ways that are far more uh, you know, involved and subtle and nuanced than, than Philip Roth. Including Proust. Uh, including Proust, absolutely including he Proust. He was who was not a believer. Yeah. Uh, but but I personally, you know, don't see things that way in the least. I think uh, we're getting somewhere again. Uh, as you look at the entire body of work for Roth, you'd be very hard pressed to find God. You might notice it in Eli the Fanatic, a right. very early, and I think everywhere in Columbus, aberrational work, right? And then God goes missing for a very very long time, and I think you've you've cut to uh, a major. Uh, bifurcation or dichotomy that we're having here. God is not there in that fiction, and you must judge it on that basis, right? That it's not a first cause at all. The first cause, the primary mover, is art or beauty or uh, titillation. That is what moves Roth. Certainly, certainly not God, or maybe Judaism or Newark. My question for you, uh, Adam, is I have this intuition that Philip Roth is the chronicler of secular Jewish America at its high point, uh, from the great mid-century when it crested to the drawdown around the 70s and 80s, and since the Posen Foundation is sponsoring this today, there's a lot of concern and chatter and reinvigoration and attempts to reinvigorate secular Judaism. So my first question to you, and then I'm going to ask Liel, do you see him as a chronicler of a secular Jewish ethic, aesthetic, worldview, and mentality? I'd say definitely yes, and that if people are reading Roth in 100 years, 200 years, one of the reasons will be to understand this moment in American Jewish history, if that's something that people are still interested in at that time. Um, and I think that if you, one of, we talked earlier about writers who are more Jewish. I think if you looked at any writers of our generation, right, uh, Jonathan Safran Foer, uh, Nathan Englander, Dara Horn, uh, Jew, I'm talking about Jewish American writers in their 30s, early 40s, they are um, infinitely more respectful, reverent, pious than Roth is. And the reason why is because, as just as I mentioned earlier, apropos of Sontag, Roth was in the enviable position of rebelling against what seemed like an eternal order of things, which was the sort of narrow-minded, Jewish bourgeoisie, uh, still in contact with tradition in some ways, uh, still going to synagogue. 50 years later, that thing to rebel against has disappeared. And Roth is the eternal son, right? He's someone who always writes from the perspective of the son, never from the father. Um, and that's another way of phrasing the same disagreement or the same dualism. Uh, you can be the son as long as the father is there. When the father dies, then you have to become the father, right? And that's something that he's never done. And that's something that uh, young writers, young Jewish writers today are maybe even overly conscious of. So if you look at 80-year-old Roth versus 35-year-old Jonathan Safran Foer, um, it's the 80-year-old who's the rebel. It's the 80-year-old who is transgressive, and it's the 35-year-old who is uh, reverent and good and ethical. Though there are writers, and I sincerely doubt uh, they're going to gain laudits from the two of you, but there are writers such as Gary Steingart and Lara Vapniar who are clearly in that tradition of non-belief, and that is uh, their first cause or, or their primary mover. What are some of the attributes of this secular Judaism that you see in Roth? If it had its virtues and commandments and meets vote, what would they be? And then I want to get Leo on this. Well, it would be uh, America. I mean, the themes, which are the big themes in Roth and are the big themes of our lives, are American Jewish response to the Holocaust, guilt about not being affected by the Holocaust, um, uh, the American Jewish feelings about Israel, the combination of admiration and envy and guilt towards Israel and towards Zionism, uh, feeling that Judaism has become an ethnic identity rather than a religion, and and concern about to what extent it can sustain itself in those terms as an ethnic identity if there's no religion behind it. Um, those are the big questions for American Jewish identity still, I'd say, and Roth has written better than anyone about them. Excellent. Leo, what do you see there? If he is describing a secular Jewish America, what are the valors and the virtues of that America for Roth? Well, I, 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 think, I, think, I think Adam nailed it 
pretty well. I, th I don't have anything to add to that. I think these are, these are the premises. Uh, uh, whether or not he explores them to your liking is a different question, but I think as, as a chronicler of, of tremors, uh, he's very effective. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Mm -hmm. Let me throw out a couple of more. Peoplehood, Jewish peoplehood, do you see that in Rolf? Yes, yeah. I mean, you have to think about how much he's interested in Israel in those books in the 80s and 90s. The Operation Shylock and the Counterlife are really all about Israel and all about what relationship an American Jew can have to Israel. Um, he is constantly aware of being Jewish and of writing about Jews and for Jews, that he's being read by Jews. Um, and then in this documentary, the very first thing that he's quoted as saying is, I've never liked being called an American Jewish writer. I don't write Jewish, I write American. He saw Bello and Ogie March that, you know, uh, right. it impelled him, right, compelled him to embrace that. Humor. Uh, say what you will about the God believers. I think the uh, simple non-believing Jews such as myself, I think we're a lot funnier in all due respect. What about humor as a quintessential virtue of the secular Jewish experience? <laughs> well played, Berliner Blau, well played. <laughs> uh, although, you know, uh, the, the, the count's still going. It, it may turn out that the joke is on you. Um, I, um, I think that the novels are very funny. I don't think that there is any doubt about that. I do think that some of them are funny in a way that, upon second reading, kind of makes it... Uh, it's like watching an old Saturday Night Live episode. You know, once you know the premise of the skit, it's not as humorous. Uh, but I don't think that there is any, uh, or could be any doubt that uh, if we are talking about masters of the form of the skit, uh, the the elaborate setup of the premise, uh, the dynamics of the energy, uh, it, you know, the tirade really works best when when funny, and uh, very frequently it really is. But it's a great, ver I was reading David Brooks's, I'm sure every single person in this column read David Brooks going to Pomegranate in Midway, oh, yes. Brooklyn, which is my neighborhood, um, which is where I grew up, and I've watched that neighborhood change from the uh, secular Jewish enclave par excellence to an uh, ultra-Orthodox community. And the one thing I wanted, to, I wanted to tell David Brooks many things, right? but one thing I wanted to point out is, but they're not funny. They're nice people. They're good. I like them, right? They're my, they're my parents' neighbors. I live in Washington now. The humor is not a major part of the way they see their everyday interaction. For that, you need a Larry David, who is a sort of clone or an excrescence of the Roth worldview, who wants to make every interaction either unpleasant or Wait, hysterically but, but, funny. But then, then allow me two points. Uh, and they're completely contradictory, and that's totally fine. That's good. Uh, the first one uh, is that I am, I am um, a little bit worried of that tendency of the last three, four decades in, in American cultural life uh, to, to sort of sanctify mirth above all. Mm. Uh, you know, funny has its spot. Uh, funny is important. But, but to see uh, repeatedly uh, institutions that to me are sort of inherently uh, non-humorous having to succumb to, to these embarrassing uh, ceremonies of public humiliation just for the sake of showing their with itness. Uh, see the president have to go out there and tell jokes. Do, do you do you see Abraham Lincoln doing that? I mean, yeah, he had this. Abraham Lincoln this told lots of jokes. No, I know, but but I mean, for 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 sort of like public uh, kind of. Do you see Thomas Jefferson standing out there and interacting with Jimmy Kimmel? I mean, th th there is to me uh, something to be said about uh, the sanctity of of a sense of mission. That's number one. Now, number two, and uh, that's not the important point. Uh, the important point is this: um, for all his humor. Roth is absolutely fucking joyless. Uh, it's the sort of humor that is that is acerbic, that is bitter, that is cutting, that is jagged, uh, but that doesn't have what to me is is the the sort of the best function of 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 of, of you know lasting humor. Uh, that sense of uh, of of shared experience, that sense of of the joke emanating uh, from a place higher than just the easy put down. This is like, you know, the class bully who says, oh, your name is so, so it just happens to rhyme with fart, so I'm going to call you fart. Uh, it's really funny, uh, but it's not generous. Uh, and to me, that matters a lot. Hmm. I'm going to come back. I'm going to How, think about by the way, uh, the, 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 the word joyless, uh, uh, you know, appears about 15 times in the essay. I was very happy to discover that. I'd forgotten that and was invigorated by it. I'm going to think of the funniest Roth line and come back at him for a second. One other secular virtue before we go to our final frame 
Um, I don't think people have noticed the degree to which Philip Roth concentrates on craft in his uh, work. And I, I've often argued this is a very secular Jewish virtue. I'll give you some examples. Glove making mm -hmm. in American pastoral, right. taxidermy, and I married uh, a communist, butchery and indignation, where Roth, we know, actually went to Crown Heights and observed Jewish butchery. So you have the writer studying the craft, but you have the writer extolling the craft. Oh, and doctors, which is a theme I've been thinking about a lot in Roth's fiction lately, how doctors are that kind of godly, universal, ultimate truth in almost every Roth novel I've ever read. Doctors tell you the truth, that you're going to die. They tell you what cancer is. They tell you what will happen to your heart if you take this beta blocker uh, in order to increase your erectile uh, function. All right, so with that said, Adam, I see in Roth a very secular Jewish celebration of craft, uh, Mickey Sabbath with the puppetry, right, of people who are very good at what they do, who are worldly, not otherworldly, because they're so obsessed with excelling in their secular vocations. I don't know if I'd say that that's Jewish. I mean, it, it, to me, it might come more out of Hemingway. Mm -hmm. Hemingway has a lot of the same ideas about craft, about in, or Conrad even. In a secular universe, you have to be good at something. That's what you can count on, is being good at something. Um, you might not be able to know what, it's, what it means in ultimate terms, but at least you know you can sail the ship. You could right. read it as coming from Luther, ultimately, but I think this generation of secular Jews excelled at Nobel Prizes, right? Physics, chemistry, university, president. Oh, it's also a journalism. class thing, which is important in Roth, that, and this is interestingly unlike Bellow, that Bellow is very constantly talking about how important it is to him to remain rooted in the environment that he grew up in, but of course he's not at all. Mm -hmm. Whereas Roth, I think, genuinely gives you the sense that he is rooted in that environment that when he goes back to, in his mind, when he goes back to Newark, um, that he he still lives in that Newark, in that sort of lower middle class, first generation Jewish American. Yeah, that, that hungry secular Jew, exactly. right, who wants to prove to the native born, right, uh, what he or she is made of. All right, our final frame, I'm gonna ask Liel to read about it as we think about the Jewish future and we ponder the place of death in Roth's fiction. Liel, would you please do the honors? I sure will. The stupendous decimation that is death sweeping us all away. Orchestra, audience, conductor, technician, swallows, rents. Think of the numbers of Tanglewood alone just between now and the year 4,000. Then multiply that times everything. The ceaseless perishing. What an idea. What maniac conceived it. And yet what a lovely day it is today. A gift of a day. A perfect day lacking nothing in the Massachusetts vacation spot that is itself as harmless and pretty as any on earth. So Adam, to bring everything together, what maniac conceived it? Right. And, and he says, I think truly, that and this is obviously a very old theme. What he's saying here is exactly the same thing that there's the famous um, thing in Herodotus about the emperor De Xerxes, I guess, is uh, about to launch his army to conquer Greece, and he sees the 100,000 soldiers, and he starts to cry, and they ask him, why is he crying? He says, because it, I just thought that in 100 years, all of these men will be dead. Um, and that's exactly what he's saying. And that's one of the oldest truths. I mean, that's in the Bible too, right? That's in Ecclesiastes. Um, that there's no redeeming value to all this. And that's what he believes, that there's no redeeming value. There's nothing to weigh against death in the scales. Course, death right. ends everything, except possibly for art, which survives. Very well said. What maniac conceived it? Well, I suspect one born 79 years and 364 days ago. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's my answer. Uh, my answer is someone, you know, someone said to me once something that, that sounds very, very uh, hokey, but, uh, but I, I believe in that. Um, when you're young, you, you conceive of life as, as a sprint. You know, you run very fast as far as you can. Uh, then when you get older, you realize it's a marathon. You know, it's a very long and arduous race where you have to keep pace. But then when you truly get the meaning of it, you understand it's a relay race. Mm. You're simply passing it along. Um, and I think Roth's inability to do that uh, speaks volumes. But he's the son, the perpetual son. But Liel, he's acknowledging he doesn't know, right? I mean, you're, you're demanding something from Who him. Who does? Epistemologically that he can't do, right? He, 
He doesn't no, know no, what on. maniac can see. I'm demanding of him something that epistemologically no human being by definition of being human could do. Uh, that has not stopped but some many to believe find they, one right. or, or no, or at least have taken that question seriously mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, well, you know, what maniac? Uh, you know, that's, that's an outburst. Uh, and, and this is... This is a late book, my friend. You can't say this is like a 25-year-old goodbye Columbus vintage. This is a man in his, what, 60s, 70s, right? Uh, at that point in the game, I expect of you as a serious thinker, as a serious human being, fuck thinker or writer or anything, just as a person, you know, to have formulated a thought that is beyond, you know, what he seems to be capable of. Uh, and, and furthermore, to evolve, and, and, and I think actually, Adam, you mentioned before his, his acknowledgement to the young writer, uh, really does speak volumes. Because if you care about this craft, which I, which I agree that he does, foster it, mm -hmm. help it, make it grow, become the father at some point, in some way, in some limited way. I mean, that is the theme of every shitty B Hollywood movie, right? The man child who can't, every Adam Sandler movie is about this. You know, the man child who can't grow up finally grows up and plays the father to some sort of son figure. Um, he can't do it, man. He just cannot do it. I would agree that perpetuation of the line has always been difficult for Rolf. Uh, whatever happened to Maria Zuckerman in the counter? Where did she go, right? She was pregnant, right? We thought that a little Zuckerman was going to appear. No more he's, Maria's. He's, he's sterile. What happened to those kittens that he adopted in one of those novels that he kicked out of the studio because they distracted him from writing? So the inability to nurture, ultimately, says Leo Leibovitz, Berliner Blau is not entirely sure, might play a role in his legacy, right? The inability to nurture offspring and to nurture literary offspring, though I feel that many in the audience will point out that there are a lot of young writers. Uh, that are deeply, deeply indebted. Oh, I agree with uh, that. Uh, to Roth. Yeah. Right? That's now, not. And he has nurtured some of them, though, in ways that I'm not quite aware of. With that said, folks, first of all, let's give these two a uh, very warm round of applause. And. And here we go. Let's take some questions. Please, no manifestos. And because I hate anonymity on the internet. Just tell us your name, tell us where you're from, so uh, it doesn't feel like a, a chat room. And if manifestos, make them funny. Yeah, if you're going to manifestize, be secular about it. Yes, this ah. one over here, go on. Hi, um, my name is Jackie, I'm from Brooklyn, and um, I guess, th I mean, you can answer, but uh, it's really for, sort of for Adam. Um, when I think of Roth, I, I can't help but think of Allen Ginsberg and the whole impact of confessional poetry, and, you know, to me, what you see as his pointless ranting, to me is, you know, it's kind of the same in Kaddish where, you know, he's ranting because he's so powerless against his mother's craziness. And I think, you know, to me, Roth is doing something very similar. So I just wanted to know if you could tie that random thought together for me. Yeah, well, I mean, I think Liel should, I would like to hear what he says about this because this is what you were complaining about. This is what you were tracing to Lena Dunham. And I think it's bigger than Roth, obviously. It's a, a whole movement. It's the, it's the 60s, basically. And you can't, if something's that big, you can dislike it, but you can't just wish it away. And there have to be reasons for it. There have to be reasons why that became so popular, why so many people changed, why at the same time that Roth was writing Portnoy, you had Mailer writing about the Democratic Convention with himself as a character, and you had Robert Lowell writing his poems about himself in mental hospitals, and um, all of these people writing in a similar vein at the same time, uh, that there was a different idea of what authenticity was, that authenticity meant not claiming more wisdom than you have, but writing out of the ignorance and the desperation and the sort of limitedness that you actually are. And Roth is one of the great exponents of that. Um, to this person's question, I'm sorry to get your name? Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Um, there's a little section in Sabbath's theater some of you might want to look at uh, where Sabbath loses it. And it's the one moment in Rothian prose that I know of where you might justifiably word for word compare him uh, to the Kerouacs and the Ginsburgs and the Burroughs. It's a very, very curious passage. I think it's like page 180 something. I can't, but you might want to check that out. Liel, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, I, 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 want, to, I want to add uh, on, on, a, on a riff of what Adam said, uh, with which I agree, but, but I think there's a fine line between that and just taking, 
you know, too broad a license uh, of just saying, well, man, fuck it, and nothing's noble, man, so I'm just, I'm just going to do my thing here. Uh, there, there are traditions, uh, and, and they exist for a reason. And, and one of the reasons, for example, that I so absolutely revere Leonard Cohen, who I admit is, uh, nor, is neither our greatest poet uh, nor our greatest singer-songwriter, because for my money, it's Bruce Springsteen every day of the week. Uh, but one thing that Leonard Cohen understands that Kerouac uh, and, 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 and Ginsburg didn't is that, you know, in Jeremiah's day, uh, Jeremiah looked around and saw the best minds of his generation, you know, howling. Uh, this is not a new condition. So, so you, could, you could ask yourself, well, you know, how am, I, how am I dealing with this? And you could give some sort of, uh, you know, answer that says, well, I'm going to invent a brand new religion. I'm going to invent, you know, uh, a, a Ginsbergian uh, type construct or uh, or a Rothian type construct, or you could be uh, Leonard Cohen and say, uh, you know, um, ring the bells that still could ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. That's that's what an adult says. That's what a very smart uh, Jewish adult says to me. No, so, I mean there are things that are noble for Roth uh, literature is noble. Mothers are noble. Doctors are noble. Art is noble. There are really, vir they're not, I, I'm afraid, they're just not necessarily consonant with your noble virtues, right? But there are things that he passionately... Do you think that Mrs. Portnoy is treated as a noble creation? Mrs. Portnoy is not... Do um, you think Hope Lanoff as a wife, uh, not a mother, though? Hope Lanoff is a great character, right? Hope Lanoff is a person that sees through the shit. R remember, uh, in Indignation, there's a character who tells uh, the young man that your job as a writer is to see the shit and to understand what Hope Lonoff after 20 odd years right with E.I. Lonoff sees what he's about she steals the show she takes everyone down right did you all notice that she's a writer as well have you noticed how many women writers there are in Roth's fiction that take down right the colossal male egotistic writer. Hope Lonoff writes little poems that she hangs up uh, in her kitchen. Let's get to this gentleman over here. Uh, my name is Ralph Seliger and I'm from the Upper West Side. And uh, I, th there's something about, um, you know, Roth's uh, counter history novel, uh, The Plot Against America, which uh, I, I think is, is odd and, and different from most counter histories in that you have, he pulls on the thread mm. of the real events of World War II and uh, posits this situation where the United States is not involved in the war for an entire year. And then you come off to the exact same result. Um, and so I wanted to get your learned uh, thoughts on that. All, right, all yours. Yeah, I mean, that is one of the funny things about that book is that it's, and to me, it is a postmodern or self-conscious gesture of Roth saying, this is only a thought experiment. I know that. I know that this didn't happen. And therefore, eventually, the thought experiment has to end and be sutured back onto the history that we all know so that nothing fundamentally changes as a result of what happens in the plot against America. Uh, Roosevelt comes back into office, I think, and then America gets bombed a year later and everything happens as it's supposed to. But the very... Um, tentativeness and elusiveness of this nightmare that he's having about America to me makes it more powerful because he's saying this is the worst thing that could have happened to me in my lifetime and it didn't happen but did we come close to it and and that's what makes it a scary book uh, it's um, in the counter life there's if slash then about 10 15 pages out where he's kind of explaining his understanding of ontology metaphysics if slash then and I think what happens in uh, The Plot Against America is Roth really explores if slash then. In an interview, I believe, with Tina Brown, he said it was an inside-outside book, right? He was going to take something very inside. He was going to write about his family, right? The central protagonist is called Philip Roth, right? Sandy is, in fact, his brother. That's his family he's writing about. That was the inside part, right? And he wanted to see what kind of energy he could generate by going really outside and reversing um, all of American history. So it creates an interesting tension. I agree with Adam what's weird, and I agree with you, Mr. Selinger, right, that it kind of reboots, right, and then everything is uh, uh, normal uh, once again. Uh, Plot Against America, as you know, um, Liel, there weren't enough awards, right? 
historians were very, very American historians were very impressed with that work. He received an award, I believe, from the American Historical Association as the great work of fiction uh, for the year that it came out. So I, I do think there are some very compelling and interesting. No, you're nodding your head. In. Well, I, I just think you know when you. I mean, really, if you, really, if you if you change history like that, it wouldn't have come. I mean, you know. Uh, Nazi Germany's victory was not so far-fetched. I mean, it really could have happened. I think if you took the United States out of it for an entire year at this critical time, I think that might have made a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, uh, Liel's trying to find the pleasures of text and the truth. There's an aunt, I forget her name. Uh, she's a seditious, traitorous aunt who touches him in a certain way, which is sexually arousing. What is the narrator? Nine years old, 10 years old, right? Seven years old, actually. Uh, and she touches him, she's always touching his arms, and he's sexually aroused by it. And as I think back in my past, I can't remember who the aunt or who the woman was, but there was somebody like that. And I was very, very surprised with sort of a ple the pleasure of recognition, right? To see a writer that had that memory, which is probably a memory that every male child, and perhaps unfortunately every uh, female child has had of somebody who's older and touches them in a certain way. For me, that's what literature does, right? It reminds me uh, of that particular sensation, which is unusual and almost um, not to be spoken about. I, I, I can't say anything charitable, uh, but, but, but let, me, let me remind you that as the ant is touching young Philip Roth, uh, there's, 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 a, there's a war that is extremely real happening outside and as the gentleman mentioned it it would have taken work but would not have been impossible to portray a very similar scenario while remaining true to its own sure. conditions and logic uh, and that he failed to do that no matter how accurate the historical description uh, no matter how how uh, uh, riveting the emotional landscape is is again uh, to say the least, and to remain uh, cordial as the man's face and 80th birthday uh, birthday wishes are, are above us, um, is baffling. And she's a traitor to America, and she's a traitor to the Jewish people. There are people like that. Deal with it. Right? That's what fiction has to She's a real person. That's what I would say to you, distinguished colleague. All right, let's get some other oh, oh, hi. words. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We went out of order. Uh, let's get this woman and then this gentleman. Yes. Hi, my name is um, jo Joy Shulman. I actually went to the same high school that Roth went to about we 20 played. years later. And I guess to me, even though I totally agree with the self-indulgence of some of the stuff is like disgusting, and his whole sexual genre is like who knows what world he's in. But frankly, you know how you, when you read an article about something where you were there, it never seems accurate. I feel like Roth is the opposite of that. I mean, I really know what he's talking about, and yet he rings absolutely true. He doesn't, like, miss a note. And when he has descriptions about what people work on, mm -hmm. if you know someone who works that way, it's really true. So on the one hand, all this narcissism is somewhat countered by, I mean, maybe it's just pride and craft, but regardless, he has to get out of yourself, actually re really look at someone, know how they'd feel in the situation. And I think his last, the indignation, the nemesis, all, so he's very much of, you know, it's sort of like people are lower middle class, they're assimilating, they're striving, and all the aspects of that and the harsh self-judgment, I think really capture something quite well. And in some ways, the human stain, what's so interesting about this person passing isn't because he might be light-skinned, it's because he knows the people around him so much that he can have their expressions, the way they walk, all the stuff. So it's interesting what Roth does, he's so accurate about observing and describing. And then in fact, Coleman Silk in The Human Stain, he can pass because he has that capacity too. So I, I think that whole thing is extremely interesting and I think his ringing so true is sort of what makes him in a you know an an amazing writer despite all his you know craziness the narcissism is the kindling for tremendous powers of observation would you agree I don't think that is an epistemological possibility mm -hmm. <laughs> in art narcissism come on I mean all right um, 
You want to give us a quick example? Uh, is there a particular detail, and then we'll throw it to Adam, that you're very fond of, that he really captures, and only the narcissist? He talks about, like, Coleman Silk and the Human Stain. He has a J Jewish uh, boxing coach, mm -hmm. right? And here this guy actually lives very much, he's from East Orange or whatever, his, his whole social relations are overwhelmingly African-American, but he's able to pretend he himself is Jewish because he is so observant about how, how this guy functions as his boxing coach, mm -hmm. his expressions, what he helps him with, the whole... Um, okay. Adam, were you convinced by the whole saga of Silky Silk, Coleman Silk? I feel like, I mean, this is something we haven't done enough justice to, is Roth as a realist, and he is a realist. He's, um, a, he's not a realist in the same way that Bellow is, where you feel like there's another world shining through this world, and that the specifics of this world, the particulars are being illuminated in some way. But he is a, a more dogged kind of realist. And one of the things that uh, I think you mentioned and that struck me in the documentary that I saw is that he talks about how he does research. I mean, that's something you don't think of Philip Roth doing necessarily up in his farmhouse in Connecticut, but that he says when he wants to write about a jeweler, he went on Broadway and stopped at all the jewelry stores until he found a jeweler who was willing to take him in the back and show him how it worked. Uh, when he wanted to write about a grave digger and every man, he went to the cemetery and met a grave digger and said, can I come watch you dig a grave? So that kind of thing, uh, I think, is something that we have overlooked in this discussion. Mm -hmm. I believe this might be our last question. Okay. Yes. I, uh, my name is uh, John Braden. I'm a writer, and I also teach writing in Newark um, at uh, Essex County College, where my students are uh, mostly poor black minorities, and they know nothing about Philip Roth until I talk to them and tell them who he is. And I'm so happy that finally, uh, you know, after many semesters t mentioning Roth, one of my students finally read Portnoy's Complaint, and she loves it. She thinks it's great. Um, <laughs> I wanted, I wanted to say that I'm a huge fan of Roth, and I also think there's something healing about the portrayal of the dysfunctional family as it is, and with humor, uh, there's something very therapeutic about, about that. And I think there's something as oppressive, I think dysfunctional families and churches kind of have a, you know, and, and, and the dark side of churches, you know, there's that oppressiveness that he sort of critiques that. And also I'm reading Bakhtin now for the first time. He's a Russian literary critic and Bakhtin says that the novel, the modern novel as we know it, began in laughter, he said. And that's when it broke away from the kind of uh, epic poetry and the Greek novel when it got into, and Rabelais, he's a big fan of Rabelais, he says that's, you know, and the sketchology, uh, you know, that, so that's something that can also be there's a place for that. And, uh, and I recently read uh, Marcuse's uh, The Aesthetic Dimension, where he, uh, Marcuse says that, you know, literature doesn't have to do everything, you know. Even if it de deals with the emotions in an honest way, there's even something political about that. You don't have to. So I, and I, I'm not sure if I understand Marcuse completely, but he's critiquing that Marxist that every novel has to change the world and save the world. Maybe Roth does what he does well. and. And maybe that's good enough. I'm so apprehensive about unleashing Liel Leibovitz on Herbert Marcuse. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm very apprehensive I've, about I've that. Learned I feel you're way. revving up. Never, but, right? never, never, never comment on Marcuse. So let me ask you guys. Just like question. my grandmother always told me, never comment on Marcuse. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's going to go all Adorno on Marcuse. Uh, just the, the last question. Um, will we read Philip Roth? 50 years from now, and you get the 500. You get the 50. 50, Adam. In 50 years, will we read them? We. Yes. Yeah. What will we read? What will be the novel that we uh, identify as his masterwork? The one that will be in, in textbooks will be Portnoy's Complaint because it was the most famous. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. The same answer. 500? 500 it's years from Portnoy's Complaint. When we're fleshy-headed mutants, we'll be reading? Uh, some sort of relic, yeah. <laughs> and I think it will be... I think it will be Sabbath's Theater, or I think it will be The Counter Life. That, that's uh, my assessment of his greatest works. There's also Dying Animal. My favorite is The Ghost Rider. I think we'll read The Ghost Rider a long time from now. Anyhow, I think we learned a lot tonight. I think we had two great interlocutors. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Philip Roth. Thank you, The New School. Thank you, Posen Foundation. And good night. Thank you. <laughs>